Hello, please let me see your ticket stubs for the Double Edge Double Bill, where you get two film and or media discussions for the price of one, which is nothing. Each week, Adam Thomas and Thomas Mariani will come to the table to read and select the yin and yang of a double feature. One will have two good movies, the other two bad ones. Both will have to pick a number between 1 and 10 in order to seal their fates for each episode. Let the chaos begin. I am Adam Sidewinder Shifty Thomas. And I am Thomas Mariani. And everybody everywhere is going to know that Adam Thomas is a coward. Oh, cinnamon and biscuits. <laughs> I just, behind the scenes, everybody, I did not know he was going to do that voice, and I'm so happy he did. <laughs> I didn't know either until I started reading it. <laughs> it just came to him. It's a great actor's yeah. choice. Yeah. Um, Michael Winslow. Michael Winslow. All right. <laughs> but, but while we're sitting here uh, sipping on some moonshine, I see a lone gunman is coming to the saloon. It's the man with no name. Except Jonathan Habden McHale is his name. Jonathan, how are you? It's high noon, and I'm here to pick the roughest, toughest movies for these two lily... Uh, I can't think of an insult. <laughs> Sorry. Hi. Oh, You're so close. You had it. You were on a roll, sir. You were so close. Um, but yes, in case you couldn't tell, our topic of the week is romantic comedies. No, it's westerns. We are obviously doing the western genre in honor of um, the lower uh, tier release of The Sisters Brothers, starring Walking Phoenix and John C. Riley, which is a western film, is coming which out. Which I totally want to see. It looks interesting. I'm, I'm very yeah. curious about it. Um, but uh, yeah, we are doing westerns uh, for the evening. And for those of you who don't know how our usual... Uh, back and forth goes. Uh, it involves um, we both come to the table only knowing the topic, um, and each of us bring two movies that the other one doesn't know about. And usually, each of us would guess number between one and ten from each other's picks, and that decides our double feature that we discuss uh, after our intro here. But because we have a uh, lone gunman over here, uh, we're gonna have him draw and uh, do a few paces to see which one of these movies we end up covering. So, Jonathan. Go ahead and go for Adam's good choices. Number between one and ten. Let's go with number six. You yellow belly son of a bitch. <laughs> and number seven, I have the 2017, I haven't seen it yet, Hostiles with uh, Christian Bale. I haven't seen that one either. So I figured it'd be something new to see. But at number one, I had The Searchers. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. I love The Searchers. It's so fucking good. And I'm not a John Wayne <laughs> fan usually, but that one no. is great. Uh, yeah, I, I, John Wayne's hit or miss for me, but I love The Searchers. And then I, well, never mind. I'm not going to say the other one that almost, almost was there. <laughs> we'll save it. Well, yes, we'll save it for whenever we do our Westerns 2, The Search for Jonathan's Gold. Um, but... <laughs> Westerns 2, Electric Boogaloo. <laughs> so, Jonathan, pick a number between 1 and 10 for my bad choices. Let's go with Number three. Okay. Well, at number four, I have the uh, seminal, beloved comic book adaptation, Jonah Hex. Oh, mother. Wow. Oh, God damn it. I swear to God. I swear to God. Today, I'm like, I guarantee you that Jonah Hex or Cowboys or Aliens is going to be one of these fucking picks. I swear to God. Oh, you son of a bitch. Hey, hey Adam. Yeah. At, at number nine, I had Cowboys. Oh, the, <laughs> the other number I was really thinking of going besides three what? was ten. Oh, fuck. So you didn't really dodge a bullet. Oh, God. No, I just blew my fucking ear off. <laughs> so Adam's excited. <laughs> I, actually, I, honest, I haven't seen Jonah Hicks, though. I, I've only heard its reputation. Oh, Oh, you know what, then? Have fun, you motherfucker. <laughs> I've seen it. Uh, well, we'll 
we want to thank Jonathan for coming on and put us in the stocks uh, and just letting us rest here and watch these movies. Uh, anything you want to plug, Jonathan, before you leave and we'll go on the Lonesome Trail? Uh, check out my Twitter, black underscore gendo, black spelled away, underscore G-E-N-D-O, and uh, I'm going to ride off to the sunset. Yeah! There he goes. Go cross. I'm going to drill that motherfucker in the ass. <laughs> well, uh, I think it's as good a time as any to... With a god. Jesus. <laughs> it's a good time as any to pause and get to our double feature right after this. We've all heard this story. That you're special. Magic even. That's right. Hex! Always do lock when you show up. Is that all you got? Jonah Hex. Future's right. Starts June 18th. And we are back from our rootin' tootin' double feature, and uh, what a what a double feature it was, Adam. It indeed was uh, a double feature. <laughs> we t- we saw two movies, indeed. And this time we're going to start off with our um, bad feature, um, because uh, this one has probably less to say necessarily about the movie itself, but maybe a bit more about the subject matter, which is Jonah Hex, which is based on a DC Comics character uh, created by John Albano and uh, Tony DeZuniga. Obviously, Adam, you're more of the comics guys we've said previously on the show. Mm -hmm. Were you familiar with Jonah Hex? I I mean, I'm familiar with the character, yeah, definitely pre-movie, but I didn't really read a lot of DC stuff. And I know he popped up in, like, a lot of the Vertigo comics and stuff like that. I'm familiar with him, though. Like, I know his backstory and all that stuff, yeah. I wouldn't say I'm a fan of the character, but I I knew he existed. (laughs) Much like this movie. (laughs) Yes, indeed. (laughs) Um, I did watch some stuff on YouTube. There's some great little um, histories of Jonah Hex that I did um, watch and read up a bit more on. And the character sounds fascinating because he comes from more of an era when, like, in the 50s and 60s, there was a point where, you know, sort of superheroes were out of favor and they lean more toward westerns because obviously that's at a time when the westerns were huge as a genre in film, and so they kind of lean more toward that. And then as superheroes kind of came into play, uh, Jonah Hicks was like a late creation that was kind of like a holdover from that era. But they sort of tried to adapt him into that superhero era and made him more of like a weird kind of cyberpunk character, as it were. Um, yeah, which... yeah, and they gave him like some supernatural sort of tinges to his character for a little while there. Um, I knew he popped up once or twice in like the Swamp, swamp Thing stories, uh, stuff like that. So he did. He got grouped in a lot with like the darker characters of DC, which I mean it fits for the most part. I mean the guy's backstory, you know, Confederate soldier, uh, you know, horribly scarred face, things like that. I mean it it works for him to be in the mix of you know the characters in print form. Um, this just, <laughs> I mean, this is like. DC was trying, man. They were trying at this era. You got to figure they. This was post Green Lantern, I believe. Yeah, the oh, year before for Green God Lantern. Sakes. So yeah, so we're talking about the Jonah Hex film, which came out June eighteenth, twenty ten, um, and had a troubled production. Um, it was originally supposed to be directed by uh, people who we've covered films on previously, the Misters Neville Dean and Taylor. Um, who are credited screenwriters and were going to be directing it, but had the classic creative differences issue with Warner Brothers. Um, so they picked up Jimmy Hayward, who is mostly known as an animator. Um, he previously worked for Pixar prior to this, um, and he had directed Horton Hears a Who, of all things prior. Um, and the irony of that is this came out the same weekend as Toy Story 3, hence why you probably didn't see it. Yeah. I don't know if that's the only problem. Because I remember the marketing for this film. I don't know if you do at all. You could tell then that they just had to dump this out just to try to make some money back. They were not behind this movie at all. Oh, yeah, it was clearly sabotage. You're just like, oh, yeah, we're going to have it as counter-programming for the movie everyone's going to see this summer of Toy Story 3. <laughs> Literally right. the most four-quadrant movie you could possibly put out. <laughs> um, and this is a, a no-quadrant movie, because it really doesn't appease anybody. I have a lot of friends who follow comic book movies in general, and 
and things like that, and Westerns. I'm a Western fan. Um, I don't know one person out of my millions and millions of friends and followers who like this movie. No, nah, it doesn't really have a uh, defender in the bunch. And it's a shame because it's, it's similar to another sort of cyberpunk Western um, of Wild Wild West, which we could have easily oh. had as the bad double feature. Uh, but I'll at least say this much, that Wild Wild West is more of a memorable movie. Like, there, there are things that sear into your brain, as opposed yes. to Jonah yes. Hex. Um, I watched this maybe a week ago, and I can't remember much of anything about it at all. <laughs> No, you know, and I watched this uh, last night, and the only thing I can remember is Megan Fox's bad accent. Yeah, I mean, it's miscasting. Clearly, I remember she got no. a lot of shit. Ar- yeah, I remember she got a lot of shit around the time, just because this is right around that era of the tri- Michael Bay Transformers movies where she was getting a lot of shit. But I don't think she's doing any more worse of a job than most of the other people here. Um, no. like Josh Brolin plays Jonah Hex. And who, in theory, would be great casting. I mean, just a few years prior to this, he was in another sort of neo-Western uh, No Country for Old Men. And would have mm-hmm. been like, if he had given that kind of gravitas to this role, it would have been perfect. And he's just going and talking about the Saturn route. Yep. <laughs> I'm Jonah Hex. Zero uh, fucks were given this day. <laughs> and, you know, and obviously, uh, the person lobbying for this role, there was a big hullabaloo about Thomas Jane really wanted to do the part to the point where he put himself in Jonah Hex makeup as sort of like a calling out thing for Warner Brothers. Like, hey, I want to be this part. Yeah, and, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't get it, um, though he would later voice Jonah Hex in a great animated short uh, for the DC Showcase, which was a series of shorts they did that they would put out mm-hmm. with their like directed video movies. And that short is great. I remember that. It was like the spirit, Jonah Hex, Superman vs. Black Adam. That was a great short, the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, great collection of shorts. But no, um, you, you know, the thing is, would Tom Jane... Uh, Tom Jane wouldn't have saved the movie. I mean, there's, there's nothing... Especially with the script they got. Now, there's nothing in this that just works. Now, I know it, it went through, you know, developmental hell, was changed constantly. If, if I remember correctly, like, near the end of the shoot, they gave them, like, oh, an absurd small amount of time to do a bunch of reshoots and reworks. Mm-hmm. It, you can just tell nobody gives a shit in this movie. Nobody. For, and I'm behind or in front of the camera. I'll make one exception, which I think it's because he was a very young actor. Michael Fassbender, I think, is giving a lot of a shit. It's just completely not working with this movie at all. At um, all. Where he plays sort of like, um, it very much reminded me of like Clockwork Orange Alex performance. It's fun, but it also doesn't fit this movie at all. But at least it was something I could kind of pin John to. And this is very early in his career. This is like right after he was in 300 and Glorious Bastards, just at the start. Mm-hmm. Like, even before he got the, of course, big comic book role of his career of Magneto um, in the new X-Men movies. And the world that, that kind of, like, jump-started him into, like, big name status. Uh, and you can tell he's at least hungry and trying, which can't be the case for a John Malkovich oh, or, <laughs> or a really weird casting of Will Arnett for, like, yeah, that was that. Yeah, what? Why Will Arnett? I I, I mean, because the whole time too, and I mean, maybe just because it's Will Arnett, you're expecting just shenanigans. So that kind of threw me off a little bit. And plus, like you said, Malkovich. Oh my God, could he care any less? I mean, he is just sleepwalking through this movie, dude. There's only one sort of comedic beat that he does, and it's a beat that makes no sense in the movie. It still got, like, a sore thumb, because there's a point when they're, like, putting up power lines, and he's just like, oh, this is the way of the future, Jonah Hex, uh, people are gonna be using electricity and future power all the time, and then someone gets shocked, and he's like, the future looks bright, for sure, but it's like, dude, uh, you you just had a scene not 15 minutes ago where you were using, like, giant Gatling guns on your horse. Yeah, right, that, exactly. What? <laughs> this is so stupid, like, it's just the perfect example of how this movie constantly contradicts itself with where it wants to be cool but also it wants to have this kind of sarcastic attitude for Jonah Hex that doesn't mm-hmm. really work it feels like it's constantly going back and forth and contradicting itself like that right and as far as I know 
Um, again, not reading the source material too much. I don't believe he ever had the power to talk to the dead. No, that was something that I, I read up on. That's a big stickler thing with Jonah Hex fans, was apparently that was not the case uh, in the comic book form. Um, it does clearly feel like a studio note of like, well, it's a superhero movie, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> we gotta get him to point A to point B and do something cool. Um, and then, you know, fucking Jeffrey Dean Morgan. Oh, <laughs> God's sakes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. You know, that guy has been in more comic book movies than people realize. Jeffrey Dean Morgan. He's in Batman vs. Superman as Thomas Wayne. Right. He's in Watchmen. Right. He's in Jonah Hex. Right. He's in The Losers. Right. Uh... Walking Dead, technically, uh, it's a TV Walking show, Dead but still comic related. Based on a comic book, yeah. I mean, he pops up all over the place. Um, and I mean, why? Because <laughs> he doesn't give a shit either. It, it's it's. I like Jeffrey Dean Morgan. I really do. In fact, I love. He was my favorite part of the movie, the Watchmen movie, because I'm actually a supporter mm-hmm. of that movie. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's just wasted here. And the thing is, he wasn't even a big enough star. At this point, really, for people to be like, oh my god, there's Jeffrey Dean Morgan. Um, right, he, it's an uncredited cameo, which you figure, like, isn't that something you give to, like, some bigger star? Right, exactly. Like, pull a Brad Pitt and Deadpool 2 sort of deal. <laughs> right. Um, I don't know, see, I'm not sure, I know he's on that Supernatural show, and I'm pretty sure that show was going at the time this movie came out, because that show has been going for, like, 23 years now, or whatever. <laughs> Um, it's been going since the beginning of time at this point. It's looped back <laughs> around and it started since the beginning of time. Right, exactly. And I know he's on that. I think he plays their dad or something. I, I believe so, yes. So maybe they were relying on that for him for some kind of pull, but it's just he wasn't even in... I know it's uncredited, so obviously he, they're not going to really announce the fact that he's in it, but I just feel like it's a wasted potential for something that could have been cooler. Oh, this movie is is very much Full that. I mean, yeah. you got also other people like Lance Reddick pops up, and you're like, what the fuck are you doing here, dude? John Gallagher Jr., before he was much of a big thing. Wes Bentley with his admittingly impressive sideburns. Like, I've, I've said this before. Wes Bentley, what he makes up for in non-charisma, he makes up for in facial hair growth. He's <laughs> so Hunger Games, this... Uh, uh, right now he's got a weird show, beard <laughs> right <laughs> dude can grow facial hair right, very impressive yeah, he's, he's good at it but, <laughs> I fucking hate Wes Bentley man that was um, terrible ever since American so Beauty <laughs> that was it yep yeah because oh god anyways um, no and the problem is they if they didn't go with it they didn't go at it you know what I'm saying no. like if they would have really went dark with this movie and really brought, you know, what happened with the Southerners, you know, the Confederates were doing during the war or had a lot more like, I hate to say it, but even, you know, Indian hunting sort of thing, stuff like that, really gone with it and darkened it up and made these people just deplorable, detestable pieces. Of shit. Like, especially when Jonah Hex in the comics, says apparently he did kind of um, become part of like a native tribe. Um, they sort of, like, took him in as a surrogate son, and here he has a, you know, a Native American wife and a Native American son, and they get killed. There's a lot of interesting pathos you could go for. I think that's something mm-hmm. um, that you could have gone for, but it's it's definitely clear this is in that era of superhero movies where, like, Iron Man and the Dark Knight had just become a thing. Like, this was right after that. And it was like, oh, superhero movies can actually, like, either be really consistently good or take on darker themes and all this other stuff. And this feels like it's a sort of earlier product that's been such development hell in general that Warner Bros. is like, uh, it doesn't fit. What's going on now? We'll just bury it. Just like Green Lantern had a similar issue with that. <laughs> right, 100%. Both, both these feel like 90 superhero movies. I was literally just going to say that. Yeah. This, this would have been right at home with, like, Steel, the Phantom... <laughs> Just those really bad, once again, DC movies that were coming out in the mid to late 90s. Like the Batman Forever, Batman and Robin. All of those. This would have fit right in there with them. The, mm-hmm. the, the shitty Crow sequels that all came out. <laughs> yeah. This feels like it should have been a direct to home video movie. Oh, yeah. It should Absolutely. have been dumped on DVD. There's, there's no question. 
yeah, this feels like something that, I don't know, they might... If, if it had just existed about eight years later, they would have dumped onto the streaming service that just came out. I'm sure oh, along yeah, with fucking that. Titans and all that shit. <laughs> oh, God. That seems like it's going to be a bad idea for DC. But, but fuck Batman, Adam. Yeah, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, fuck Batman. That's good. That's a good way to lead off DC. <laughs> but anyways, I you know... And this is... Like we said before, this is prime not giving a shit Malkovich, as he tends to do most of the time now. And it's a shame, because I really, really, when he's on, John Malkovich is one of the funniest and most entertaining actors to watch on screen. It's not even fun cashing in Malkovich, because there's been fun no. cashing in performances where he enacts, um, to quote Lindsay Ellis, who brilliantly summarized his whole career with this, the... A performance of Olive Garden patron who's pissed off that he didn't get his pasta right. This is more like Aragon level Malkovich. Right, and you're wanting more Con Air Malkovich. Oh, oh God, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which I can't, I hate that fucking movie too. But, yeah, no, he's not even fun bad. And another, uh, in terms of wasting a lot of talent, uh, we didn't even talk about this, a criminal waste of Michael Shannon. He just yeah. pops up as the guy who runs, like, the fucking fighting ring that's underground. Like, Ugh. it's fucking Michael Shannon. <laughs> Dude, he did a lot of this type of shit, though. Oh, that's back true. Then. Aiden Quinn. Again, another actor. It's like, why him? I don't... Although, he is Aiden Quinn. It's not like he's a exactly in-demand star at the time. But still, it's just... All right. Fuck it. I don't... You know, we're sitting here coming up with excuses for all this bullshit... Let's just call it what it is. This movie just should not have been made. It, it was doomed from day one. I don't know about necessarily that, because I would have been very curious to see the Neville Dean Taylor version of this movie. I think because, you know, we, we talked about Spirit of Vengeance um, as our first episode, but admit, Adam, that watching Spirit of Vengeance, there is at least a lot more creative choices being made, even if they do sometimes fail. There's a lot more just throwing something at the wall to see what sticks. And I think that's what I love about Neville Dean Taylor, even when their movies don't quite work. They always come up with bizarre, crazy choices that I'm surprised to get through, especially in the case of, like, a Spirit of Vengeance, through the studio system at some point. Um, but what the problem is with the Jimmy Hayward taking this on, someone trying to do a Neville Dean Taylor movie is garbage to see. Like, there's a whole oh, flashback yeah. sequence where, like, Jonah Hex rises from his makeshift grave after John Malkovich tries to kill him, and mm -hmm. it's, like, the color sat saturation, the attempts at, like, the quick cuts during the battle, it all feels so mishandled, and clearly, like, you just gave this poor babe out of the woods a live-action movie, and he didn't know what the fuck to do. Oh, yeah. You could tell they were telling him, look, we had Neville Dean and Taylor on this. They're gone for whatever reasons. Hey, do this like Neville Dean and Taylor would do. <laughs> it's like this guy's never done anything as, as far as live action goes. Um, I'd argue that maybe Jonah Hex as a character would work in a form of television series capacity. For such a dark character as he is, they'd have to pull back so much. Well, I did find this out because if you look in the credits... Matt LeBlanc is created as an executive producer, and you're like, why the fuck is this? Trivia, in the mid-2000s, after Matt LeBlanc started a production company in the wake of everyone's favorite spinoff, Joey, um, he uh, was in like trying to make a Jonah Hex TV show with Akiva Goldsman, who's also a credited executive producer. Another thing of 90s comic book movies that still exists for some reason. Why? Why the fuck does Akiva Goldsman still keep getting work at him? Uh, constantly, like Avi Arad. <laughs> but he, at least Avi Arad disappeared. This guy's still fucking around. <laughs> um, but uh, the project languished in development hell until LeBlanc's production company folded, and then when Warner Brothers started production, they had to legally give LeBlanc an executive producer credit and fee because he still owned the rights. Oh, good for Matt LeBlanc. <laughs> Joe <laughs> Tribbiani wins in the end. Look, he got a paycheck exactly when he needed it, because... No, definitely. <laughs> that lost its space money dried up. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> um, I will also say, I recommend there's an episode of the seminal Batman the Animated Series called Showdown, 
oh, which yes. features yeah, Jonah yeah. Hex. I love literally. I, I rewatched it right after I saw this movie. I'm like, oh, I want to get the taste out. That I love how that episode starts off with Batman and Robin, like, oh, we're gonna be up a couple thugs, and hey, where's Ra's al Ghul? And he's like, oh, Batman, let me tell you a story that'll explain why I've left. And then it's just the Jonah Hex story. <laughs> like they really yeah. tried to get the fuck out of just like we want to do Jonah Hex. How limited of prologue can we do? <laughs> and that no, episode's I mean, great. Um, b- both that episode and the short from the DC Showcase are written by Joe Lansdale who's a great writer of comics and books in general, and also um, most film people might know him as the guy who wrote Bubba Hotep. Oh, that's right. Hell yes. Yeah. Um, oh, that's it, right up his alley, yeah. Yeah. You know, and I, I know the characters also made an appearance on that Legends of Tomorrow show, too. Right. And I heard it's pretty decent, but, you know, in short bursts, I think it works, but... Obviously not in an hour and 45 minutes or whatever the hell this piece of shit is. <laughs> well, we'll segue into your final thoughts then. This movie is 100% piece of shit. Um, <laughs> and I don't have any... There's nothing in it, really. Um, like you said, Michael Fassbender's fun to watch, you know, with his really over-the-top, you know, where he's even pushing his accent even further and with the face tattoos, and he does come across a little bit like Alex DeLarge and just crazy, but he's barely in it. The rest is just Josh Brolin side talking out of his mouth, quipping, really shitty quips. You know, Megan Fox with a sweaty chest, and John Malkovich giving less of a fuck than he's given in a while. Uh, it's just I don't know who this movie was made for. The violence isn't even good. The acting's terrible. The, the there's no chemistry between any of the characters. Um. You can't even say it's competently directed. The visual effects don't hold up. It's just there's nothing in this for anybody. Comic fan or Western fan or whatever you are, this this isn't this is not good. <laughs> I mean, I, I agree with all that, but I'll also say it's a shame because I want something like the cyberpunk genre to work. Or like or the ste- it's more steampunk, I apologize. Yeah, this I know is what more- you mean. Yeah. This is more steampunkish, and it's just never really worked on film, and it's a shame it hasn't, because it's a cool aesthetic. I, I just don't know quite why it hasn't really gotten into the mainstream, and I think maybe it's just a case of we don't necessarily need a mainstream <laughs> steampunk movie, but I would love to see some independent filmmaker kind of take an aesthetic like a Jonah Hex and just make a fun, slightly futuristic, but also in the past sort of film or television show. I think it could really work. Especially, I agree on television with like a Jonah Hex character. Maybe they might do that for their streaming service with DC. Who knows? Um, but in this context, I completely agree. It is the definition of a studio mangled development hell terrible product that nobody really cares for it's it's got a dual grave with green lantern the movies that try to break a little bit of that old school older superhero style of movie production in the middle of the big sort of revitalization of the superhero genre and just got left in the dust uh and that is where jonah hex belongs speaking of dust and trails and depressing our next feature, yeah, you can say that. Hostiles. I don't know how you've done all these years. Seeing all the things you've seen, doing all the things you've done. Makes you feel inhuman after a while. Captain, you do know Chief Yellowhawk. The Army wants to be certain that the Chief gets home to Montana safely without incident. Have any idea what he's done? He's a butcher. Then the two of you ought to get along just fine. Understand this: when we lay our heads down out here, we're all prisoners. Okay, so uh, hostiles. First, we should note uh, we decided to do this second mainly because uh, this is a newer feature. Oh, isn't it a year, even a year old when we're recording? So we do want to say spoilers. For this. Yeah, I'll try to keep it as spoiler light as I can. And I mean, in, in all honesty, dude, there's not really much in here you can spoil. I mean, there is, but none of it's going to really like blow your mind. You know what I'm saying? Well, no, right. And this was this is a interesting example of a feature that we're doing that neither of us had seen prior. Um, Hostiles, which came out December 22nd, 2017, um, from writer director Scott Cooper 
who you probably don't know because he's done mostly sort of like mediocre Oscar bait movies, um, like say Crazy Heart, which you only might know as like, oh, the movie they finally gave Jeff Bridges an Oscar for, or the god awful Black Mass starring Johnny Depp as Nosferatu Bostonite Bobster. <laughs> See, I didn't mind that movie that much. Oh, it's so fucking bad. I didn't mind it's, it it's, too it's, much. It's terrible fucking Goodfellas. It's such garbage. And everyone, it, no, so, it, everybody's Goodfellas, though. I mean, that's all those So movies. many great actors doing terrible Boston accents. Didn't he like, do Out of the Furnace, of too? Yes, he did. Uh, with Christian Bale. Who Which I also up. didn't mind too much. But none of those movies really do stick with you. You can agree. No. That no, they're, they're that's hundred percent true. They're very. I, I feel with Scott Cooper the same way I feel about um, a rhyming name, uh, Tom Hooper, um, who I feel like it's, he's an alias almost for Tom Hooper, um, <laughs> because they're both similarly very mediocre directors that get incredible cinematographers and casts that are way too good for them, which is yes. just this movie all over. It looks gorgeous and has a killer fucking cast. Oh, dude, the cast is spectacular. That's- and I, I gotta say, even with any of the gripes, dude, some of these, some of the uh, performances in this, I mean, are the, some of the best performances I've seen the, some of these actors give in a long time. I mean, let's just get in. Christian Bale, dude, he acts his ass off in this movie. It's such an understated performance, and when he's emoting and you know gets choked up in two, three scenes, you like feel it. Right. I mean, let's briefly go into a bit of a plot synopsis. Um, basically, this takes place in 1892, so near the end of the Old West, um, definitely post-Civil uh, War era, but it features Christian Bale as Captain Blocker, um, who is a guy who has had several people in his battalion die at the hands of this one particular chief, Chief Yellowhawk, uh, played by Wes Studi, who has been a prisoner of war for a while, um, but he is dying, and so um, Stephen Lang uh, is his superior who orders him to go on a mission to bring him back to his land, um, and he has a battalion with him, and on the way, he runs into Rosamund Pike, who plays a young lady who has had her entire family killed and slaughtered um, by a bunch of natives, and... I really want to say, the big thing for me watching this movie, and the thing I've been saying since 2014, is Rosamund Pike should have a way bigger fucking career I don't than she's get had. It. She's I so great. She's an amazing yeah. actress. She's so good in this, too, man. Yes, who you might recognize oh. from Gone Girl, uh, which she was yes. nominated for, and she was amazing. And, and here, she also like steals the show, I would argue, from everybody with just some of these moments like there's a moment where she has to like they say do you want us to bear your children who she's been like looking around their corpses and Mm. she starts just like digging at the earth and eventually she just can't use the shovel and starts digging with her freaking hands and it's bloody and it's a such a great fucking scene that just shows how committed and how without any ego she is as a performer Mm. Oh, yeah, man. I mean, yeah, she's fantastic, dude. You know, even the scene where there's literally basically no dialogue where, you know, Christian Bale's character is sleeping outside so she could sleep in his tent, you know, the first night, and she comes out, grabs his gun, and then sits there, and then it shows them both sleeping up at the graves. Well, she's sleeping, he's watching her, and it's just, it's so powerful, dude. I felt so bad for her. Mm-hmm. This whole movie. I mean, the first five minutes, I'm going, oh my god, no fucking way. Once the first kid dropped on screen, I'm like, oh my god, they're killing children in the first five minutes of this movie. This is going to be a rough one. Yep. <laughs> it's fun for the whole family. <laughs> wow, yeah. wow, Wes. Pachoo, pachoo. <laughs> <laughs> With tarnations. Uh, it's a fucking bleak movie, man. It's depressing. I got a lot of problems with it, but it, it it did make me feel something. So I guess it's got that going for it. Oh yeah, uh, but and but also the, some of the other people. Uh, Jesse Plemons is the lieutenant. Uh, Adam Beach shows up as another one of the natives who are kind of going along with the Yellow Hawk. Um, well, let's Scott. let's just dude. If it's a movie with an Indian character, it's going to be Adam Beach. Probably yeah, that's true. <laughs> Remember, he could climb real good or whatever the fuck it was. Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck, you're right. <laughs> that was... <laughs> oh, I love Slipknot, my favorite yeah, Suicide Slipknot. Squad character. Yeah. 
Um, but anyway, uh, S- Scott Wilson of The Walking Dead shows up in here. Um, even uh, Ben Foster, of course, who the entire time he's with Christian Bale on any scene, you're like, I could be watching 310 to Yuma, <laughs> the remake, yeah. at any right. point during this. Um, Roy Cochran. Yeah, Roy Cochran, Stephen Lang we mentioned, Bill Camp shows up, Scott Shepard. Um, even as the lowly... Uh, French uh, part of the battalion, Timothy Chalamet, who the same season got nominated for Call Me By Your Name. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I saw him. I'm like, wait a second. <laughs> like, I couldn't, I, I couldn't believe it was him. Yeah, no, dude. It, it, there's so many character actors in this movie. It's, it's incredible. This cast is just fantastic. They really are all giving 100%. Rory Cochran, I've never been that big of a fan of his. Mm hmm. But he's fucking fantastic in this movie too. Near the beginning, where he's talking to Christian Bale, and he just yes. talks about like I'm, I, I can't fucking go back out there. What am I gonna yeah. fucking do? Great scene. And his scene where he decides he's leaving in the rain. Yes, dude. I mean, you could just see it in his face. This guy has been through the shit and seen it all, and it's fucking with him. Okay, and another thing, you, you know, I know, Ben Foster. No. Mm-hmm. Anytime Ben Foster shows up on screen, I'm like, this guy, is, there's going to be some shit popping off. In any movie he's in, for the most part, he always plays these type of characters. I just, I, I feel like he might have been one of the most underutilized in the film. I completely agree with that. Because um, when he shows up, he plays a guy who, as it turns out, um, is they bring along when they like have a stop for a moment. Mm-hmm. Um, they, he is a guy who's going to be hanged, and they're going to bring him to his hanging. Um, and he's yeah, because like, he like, axe murdered an entire Native American family. Yep, <laughs> that's what he did. Yeah. yeah, God, I agree. The palpable chemistry that's between him and Christian Bale obviously is so interesting. And then there's a whole scene where he gets he's chained up, and then he tricks Jesse Plemons into getting him out, and he shoots him point blank range. You're like, oh my God, something great's gonna happen. I mean, nothing. Then, no, he, you, you see his body later in a scene where they find Rory Cochran, um, and he's shot himself as well. Um, it's it's definitely denies payoff a lot. My problem is that feels like an inconsistent thing. Like I wouldn't mind that if the movie was more going for that on a consistent basis, but it so goes back and forth on that because you don't see the payoff of some of these other characters, and it feels like, oh, isn't this a just like life kind of movie? But then they show plenty of payoff with like Christian Bale and the other character, the Rosamund Pike. Some of these other yeah. people, they have, it's it's so inconsistent. It wants to play itself as like, oh no, we're deconstructing the Western, but then we're also kind of being a Western. I, I yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, I don't know if it quite knows what it wants to do. No, I, I agree with that. Um, because I mean, there's even one character who just dies completely off screen, and then Christian Bale comes out. Yeah, he's dead. You're like, oh shit, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Fuck. All right. Well, Jesus. And then. Um, Timothy Chalamet, he does nothing in this movie. I completely forgot he died until there was just a certain point where I'm like, oh yeah, he's not a part of the group anymore. Like, they even have a close-up <laughs> of him dead, but it's so it's so quick, and I think the editing feels inconsistent, too, where especially, yes. like, dur- the, during that whole sequence where they're, like, ambushed, and they get shot off by a couple people, it's such a poorly chopped together, sort of, it wants to be rough and tumble and gritty, but it just feels awkward the way that it's mm. cut together. You know, it's a shame because I will also say, along with the performances, uh, a lot of credit to Masanabu Takayagi, uh, who is a cinematographer, who's a great cinematographer. You might know his work from Warrior, The Grey, Silver Lining's Playbook, Spotlight, um, and he works with this guy all the time, and I feel this movie is also gorgeously shot. It always oh, dude, just... fantastic. Especially any of the dusk scenes are... Mm-hmm beautiful to watch. There's a whole scene where Rosamund Pike and Christian Bale just kind of watch the sun go down. And it's beautiful to watch, and it does a great job of kind of representing the characters, too, who are kind of feel like they're in a twilight stage of their lives anyway. Um, it's just, it's it's so incredibly immersive to watch, and once again, I feel like Scott Cooper constantly is betraying the craft of the cinematography and the actors the whole time, which makes it not a bad movie, but a frustrating movie. Yes, I agree. There's there's so much wasted potential in this movie. Uh, I mean, this movie, if if they would have just stuck with anything, really, that's the problem. They, there's they introduce all these characters, kill them off. Introduce characters, kill them off. Don't really go anywhere with anybody, for the most part. Um, and the place they go with their two big leads of Rosamund Pike and Christian Bale, I was not a fan of them becoming I mean, yeah. a couple. I, nope. I did felt that was completely unearned. 
Nope. I liked the idea that maybe in that specific moment they needed each other. I liked that they didn't really show them hook up as far as, um, you know, sexually. And then the ending just felt cheap to me. Oh, God, yeah, where it's just like, oh, they're going away on the train, but he hops on the train. Yeah, the, who cares? It's <laughs> that so doesn't... forced. And the thing is, dude, about his, even Christian Bale's character, like I said, I loved his performance and everything, but throughout the entire movie, you are reminded by other characters talking to him what a murderous, scumbag piece of shit he is. And then you're supposed to feel some sort of, like, he... I, he Redemption, like it's earned. It, to me, it wasn't earned. Like I don't want to be a backseat screenwriter, but right. I'll admit, like the movie feels like it's setting you up to, especially during there's a big climactic fight sequence with Scott Wilson's character who pops up. He's like, "This is my land, and boys, you're gonna shoot him." That like so stupid. I mean, it's it's not great, but that at least feels like okay. This is a perfect setup to have Christian Bale like stand on his ground of like, despite all the things that Yellowhawk has done to me. I'm going to protect these natives, I'm going to protect these people I've been with for so long, and mm-hmm. go out in maybe not the most impressive death, but at least a death that would make thematic fighting. sense. Right. right, fighting. Exactly. Clawing, and, you know, it feels like that would at least thematically work for him kind of making up the damage that he's done. Mm-hmm. Or at least trying to, even as all these other people die around him. But, nope. Nope. You don't get that. No, (laughs) And I only say that because the ending they give that character just feels completely needless and also feels like it doesn't really work for the story they're going with for that character because he's such a guy who's downbeaten by life, doesn't have anywhere to go. You would figure, like, this is a guy who you either kill off or make a man with no name, who just, like, disappears. Yes, 100%. Into, right, someone who would die along with the West, because this is around the time, you know, turn of the century, this would be when the West is, like, fading out of his armor. You could have made this a Red Dead Redemption-style yeah. character turn, and, and no. Well, <laughs> all he's known for at least 20 to 25 years, because of his conversation, is hunting and killing Indians and yeah. war. Yeah. Where is that guy going to go? How can that, someone like that just assimilate himself back into society comfortably and easily? I read this thing where, you know, Christian Bale didn't like the ending of the film, that it felt too Hollywood or whatever it is, and uh, Christian Bale wanted his character just to disappear, like just have him disappear into the crowd at the train station, and you, therefore you don't know where he's going. He might just be riding off into the sunset. I, I wouldn't mind it if maybe you had, if the movie, which doesn't need to be as long as it is, the, mo- the movie's also way too fucking long. Way too fucking long. This could have easily been like a hundred minute long movie, and instead it's like <laughs> over two hours. Two and a half, it's like almost but two and a half hours. If you're honestly going to extend this, I wouldn't mind if you had, say, maybe a Hurt Locker ending, where he tries to assimilate into society, and it's like, oh wait, he can't. <laughs> he can't yeah, fucking do it. Yeah, even just a quick scene of it. Like, yeah. I don't need another fucking 20 minutes of it, but, no. you know, one scene of him maybe at a store and he gets the shakes or something, because, you know, anything. You know, like a, a good old-fashioned Brooks was here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. It just throws when Pike walks in, like, womp, womp. Yeah. <laughs> maybe I just miss my friend. Um, <laughs> but, um, the cinematography and the, and the performances definitely kept me and entertained from the movie. And even while I was watching, I was talking to my wife. I'm like, I really like this movie. I even texted my brother like, man, this is a good movie. And literally the second it was over, I'm like, I don't know if that was that good. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, I'm like, uh, you know, I don't know. They could, that could have been the second half of the movie, the whole Ben Foster arc and character. Right. The ending instead of the family, the four family could have been Ben Foster. Mm-hmm. And just had a tie-up with Christian Bale and Ben Foster going at each other. Anything. Anything. They're introduced to all these characters that are basically cannon fodder. And then the, you know, half the characters that are in the whole movie, you don't really give a shit about. Like, dude, the the uh, the Indian women. Mm-hmm. I didn't... Nothing. There was, like, no character development with them. No, not at all. <laughs> and, I mean, at all. They Which, get beaten and raped, and then that's about all you get. I mean, and plus, they're mainly there to, you know, it's another example of um, Hollywood just kind of using that to, like, these minorities to help 
the white protagonist out, especially oh. like Rose. That's all oh. this Rosemont Pike is just like that's all the reason that they're there. It's just like, oh look, we made you something. It's like, oh, I can be friends with you now. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's pretty much it. Play <laughs> my hair. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which fucking happens? But um, you know, it's just. I want to like this movie. I really want to like this movie. And that's the problem with Scott Cooper as a director. All of his movies, I want to like them. Yeah. I really want to. Like you said, I don't know if it's because he gets a good cast. Usually a great score. Fucking this movie looked so beautiful like we've talked about. The constant thunder and lightning off on the horizon and just the storm clouds. and I mean, it looked absolutely gorgeous. Uh-huh. And it's just, and it, it's almost like he promises these swelling epics, but then when it's over, you just, meh. You know what it feels like, and this is why I kind of compared him to Tom Hooper. Um, my problem with Tom Hooper as an, a director, and he's the guy who did like the King Speech and Les Mis mm. and a few other things. Both of them feel like stage directors who really can work with actors very well, but don't really know how to make a visually engaging movie, even if they have a great cinematographer behind them. Right. No, that's that's 100% true. I, I agree with that, because let's face it, yeah, the, the set pieces and the scenery was gorgeous, but then all you had really was just them riding a horse through the scene. The only time where even I felt like they were even interacting with their environment was when it was raining and shit like that. Right. But her head, it's just, I don't know, man. Like you said, maybe that that's probably more or less the case that, you know, he's a stage director or I don't even know if that's true if he did come from the stage but it definitely feels like that well because he just came out of nowhere with like Crazy Heart um and um interestingly apparently he was a actor prior so we did a lot of like TV and film acting and then mm-hmm. became a director so maybe that's more the case is that he's more of an actor's director and he just doesn't quite know how to compose shots because the, the scenes that work obviously the best are whenever it's just like two actors together like an underrated person in the cast i will say is uh jonathan majors who plays the one black guy in the battalion yeah he's uh, really fucking good man. yeah i didn't know who he was but he's amazing this is especially the scene where after he's been injured he's just like mm. this might be the last time i see you and i'm like oh fuck this is like a great oh, scene right. of these oh, two dear. together um and the two just men who have lived through a lot of shit and respect each other and really it's just like we're probably never gonna see each other again but mm-hmm. you it was an honor fighting beside you. It's a great, awesome moment, and then the movie drags. <laughs> That's this movie constantly. It's just like, great, I, awesome moment, drags. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I agree. You have these great character moments, you know, where sometimes they don't even say anything. And it's just the two characters on the screen barely speaking, and you just feel it, and you're like, oh, my God. Then you get 20 minutes of nothing. And then, oh, yeah, here's Ben Foster. Fuck, Ben Foster's dead. (laughs) (laughs) Or uh, the guy he shoots, the the one, I can never remember his name. Jesse Jesse Plemons, yeah. Uh, Yeah, Meth Damon, yes. Yeah, or as I, I was just going to say, or as I call Matt Damon version 2. He's really good in the movie, and they don't really give him anything to do, though. No. And he's a good actor. Very good actor, yeah. Um, I really wanted to like this more than I did. Because I, I haven't gotten a chance to really watch a lot of movies lately, and I do love Western. I love a good Western. And, but, um, man, this was a bummer. That doesn't necessarily mean that this couldn't be a great movie, because even the scenes that we're no, talking has, about that are like total I mean, bummer it's... are amazingly put together. And we should talk about the fact that this is definitely in the sort of post-unforgiven world of Westerns. Both the movies we're yes. talking about are definitely more of these sort of late-era Western deconstructions in their own way. Jonah Hex didn't know what the fuck to do with it, um, but there have been so many great examples of that, like Unforgiven, or we talked about in video game form, Red Dead Redemption. is an amazing game. Um, I, I hope the sequel works, because we're recording this before that comes out. I'm so hoping. <laughs> Don't fuck with me, Rockstar. <laughs> I swear to God, you motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Tombstone came out around that time, um, early in that period. There's like all the westerns have come out in this end of the 20th, beginning of 21st century mm-hmm. have been these deconstructions, and this fits that mold pretty well. But what's missing is really just like an epiphany moment that you have with these characters, and I think that's something right. that Unforgiven does amazingly with all of its characters. Oh yeah, um, one of the that's... best just films ever made in general. Yes, um, absolutely. Um, Tombstone has that, um, that, you know, all these deconstructionist westerns have a point where you really see these characters as metaphor for the West dying out. Um, and this one tries to do that, just 
can't quite harness it. No, no, not right. Exactly at all. Even to the point where it's like, I, I get what they were trying to do with Rosamund Pike's character. She starts, I don't know how, where the hell are you going to start learning more about herself through the other Indians, through the West Studio and his family. Oh, you all are making me learn about myself. Exactly. I mean, that, and that's literally what, to the point at the end where it's like her big redemption is you, she adopted the boy, I guess. Pretty much, yeah. I, I mean, guess so. No, noble so, effort, but also we didn't know yeah, much about that little boy, did we? <laughs> no, nothing. Nothing. You get one very drawn-out scene of him carrying a bird egg. Oh, God, right. I forgot that. <laughs> <laughs> then, that's about it. Um, I, especially, like, with... I think that's criminal with even, you know, the male... The main Native American character of West Studi as oh. the... Cheyenne Chief, such a great underrated actor as well. He's... What a just a fucking face he's got on him. Yes, when it it's just so distinguished in the way it just even the scene where uh, Rory Cochran's character is trying to get him to talk to him outside the tent when it's raining, and he peeks his face out and just the moonlight hits it. Just a great face. I don't know how to describe it. It just looks fantastic. Yeah, and another and, great uh, character moment where he talks to Christian Bale in actual, like, the Cheyenne language, and mm -hmm. he just says, like, you're making this way more complicated than it needs to be. I don't know why you can't trust me at this point, because this, mm -hmm. is, this is my territory. I know what these guys are going to do. Uncuff me. And Christian Bale's just steadfast and, nope, not going to do it. Like, great scene, but also by the end of it, we don't really know that much of the Yellow Hawk character. Right. And you want to feel for something like, especially another, probably one of the best shots in the movie too, him on his little funeral mm -hmm. pyre. Amazing shot. It's at dusk. It's perfectly put together. It's just like, oh, I want to feel immersed in this, but it feels kind of hollow. Yeah, I don't at all. And just, and then they're like, whatever you want to reconciliation or however the hell you want to talk it with Christian Bale and West Studi. Out of nowhere, where he's like, you know, I had a friend and names all his friends that this guy supposedly killed. And he's like, but I also killed some of your brothers, too, so we're cool. And he's like, once you die, a piece of me dies, too. Like, what the fuck is going on here? You spent the whole first part of this movie not trusting him, keeping him in chains, basically almost completely refusing the job until your fucking pension was challenged. <laughs> You were going to kill him right off the bat until you decided, no, we'll just put him in fucking chains. And then all of a sudden, I love you. <laughs> what the fuck is going on? That was so unearned and forced. It feels so much just like, despite how long this movie is, it feels like we have scenes missing. And, yeah. and it, it seems like Scott Cooper like kept the wrong scenes. <laughs> Like, I, I'm a, I wouldn't be surprised if there was a great cut of this movie somewhere and Scott Cooper was like, nah, let's not do that the, version. Show me, like, five more minutes of an egg in this kid's hands. Give me well, that. And, and, you know, I think part of it is that um, what's interesting is the... Uh, I found out the history of this movie is that this was adapted from an original manuscript from writer Donald E. Stewart, who most would probably recognize um, he's written stuff like Missing, which he won an Oscar for, um, The Hunch for Red October, uh, The Clear and Present Danger, a few of those Jack Ryan movies, a very underrated screenwriter who died in 1999, and his wife found this manuscript and decided to give it to Scott Cooper to adapt, it kind of feels like this is a very limited draft movie. Like, this feels like it was a couple passes away from being a great movie. Yeah, I agree. It needed more polish. Because, like I said, and it's way too long, and like you said, it feels like it's missing shit, even at this length. Um, You know what it feels like, man? It feels like Scott Cooper watched The Revenant over and over mm -hmm. and was like, I want to make something that looks like that, but have none of the real good stuff in it. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the Revenant is a movie I have similar issues with um, in terms of great cast, great cinematography, but I, I have some issues with the way Alejandro and Naritu kind of shoots that movie, but at the very least, it had memorable moments that do stick with you, right. like the bear fight, obviously. Anytime mm -hmm. Tom Hardy says, Pelts! Amazing. Uh, <laughs> well, even the whole scene where they're escaping under the boats. Right. With the Indians. I mean, there was some dynamic shit in it. This, mm -hmm. the action scenes in this movie did not feel dynamic to me. No. Um, at all. And I mean, the, don't get me wrong, the opening, the opening five minutes like blew my mind. I'm like, I cannot believe this other start in this movie. This is going to be a fucking ride. Um, 
maybe because it wasn't flashy or anything. It was just right in your face. But then they just almost sort of adopt that technique for the whole movie. But they don't really show you much. They don't really show you anything. It's very dry and just never, much like the last movie, doesn't really go for it anywhere. Well, I think we should probably segue then to our final thoughts, Adam. All right. I this, God. I really, really, really want to like this movie. I don't think I'm ever going to as much as I want to. Not that I hate it, because there is still some stuff in it that, that is quite fantastic. Um, you know, Rosamund Pike and Christian Bale and... You know, the majority of the principal cast, I mean, are just stir- turning into stellar performances. The scenery is absolutely gorgeous. The score is decent, minimal, but decent. It's just, it's like if you're making, you know, a pizza or, you know, something else, like a pie, something you really love, and you get all the great ingredients, and then you just kind of throw it at a wall. <laughs> and only the good stuff's sticks and the rest is kind of pulling everything down with it it's, but you, you you put like salt in it in random places and you're like why the fuck did this happen right, why did i do this what the hell <laughs> ah, wait why do you use you know fucking miracle whip instead of <laughs> <laughs> for that one slice too it doesn't make any sense slice. there's no consistency in this pizza at all. Bears, what the hell <laughs> This movie has so much going for it that I I don't understand how it turned out to be just so bland for at least an hour and a half of a two and a half hour runtime. There's it's oh man. If you want to see Christian Bale better than he's been in a long time, this is worth it for that. If you want to see Rosamund Pike turn in a fucking stellar performance, it's worth it for that. Other than those two things and the scenery, I don't I I don't think I could recommend this one either to be honest. I mean it, it the problem with it is it barely skirts our double-edged double build. This is we talked about this prior in the show. Um this if we ever revisit a topic westerns will be the first one we revisit because <laughs> no, I don't think I, we gave the genre its due with both sides of this coin. Um and I think it's like like we said, it, it barely passes sort of that good feature. It's on Netflix right now as we're recording. It's it's not a bad Netflix watch necessarily. You can kind of w- watch for the good parts, and then when it gets kind of boring, get a soda, don't pause it, you're fine. Um, <laughs> and, you know, you, you don't really need to pay that much attention to it, which is a shame, because I think there's a great movie inside this good movie. Mm-hmm. And that's honestly sometimes more frustrating than a really terrible movie like a Jonah Hex. Jonah Hex passed through me pretty much like you know, water. It, it just went in and out very quickly. Didn't really stick, versus this is a movie where things do stick about it, but then you remember, oh yeah, how did this connective tissue come together? Oh right, really boring scenes where they're just kind of walking around. <laughs> where it becomes Jerry, the Gus Van Sant movie. <laughs> but, with, <laughs> but in the West. Um, it just, it, it's like I said, Scott Cooper is a director who I'm constantly frustrated by, because he gets such amazing talent, and I don't think he quite frankly earned it. At all, yeah, with any of his fucking movies. I, I don't think he really earned getting such high-caliber talent and making such, quite frankly, mediocre movies. And that's unfortunately what Hostiles is. So, uh, that is the end of our Room 2 double feature! Mm-hmm. Hooray! Get <laughs> um, off my land. <laughs> it's like Scott Wilson's in the room. I think they'll have cliche. <laughs> <laughs> Gold in them there heels. <laughs> no, that would be awesome if it was old prospect too. That's be true. way better. <laughs> I'd watch out for rattlesnakes if I were ye. <laughs> um, but before we go, we have some feedback to read from our lovely fans who we asked about their favorite and least favorite westerns. Uh, Brian Stitcher of the Horror Returns podcast says Tombstone, and he posted a gif of uh, Val Kilmer saying, "Let's have a spelling contest." And man. I, Tombstone's a movie I really want to be watched. I haven't seen it since I was a very little kid, but I remember really being immersed in it. Um, I need to give that another shot. I I like Tombstone a lot. I liked it a lot uh, growing up. Uh, Val Kilmer alone as Doc Holliday's makes that movie as good as gold. Uh-huh. It's just it gets there's quite a bit of really Hollywood type shit in it. Uh-huh. It gets a little silly in parts, but it's better than the Wyatt Earp counterpart that came out like. 
six months later. Oh, oh God. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I've never seen that. Oh, <laughs> you, ooh. Oh, thank God. Don't pick that one next time. <laughs> uh, Brian Kane says, Unforgiven is probably my favorite road trip uh, western. Um, also, really enjoyed Trigun, a sci-fi western anime that heavily influenced the Borderlands games. Um, Scott Johnson says, Good. Um, this would be considered a neo-western, but Hell or High Water is absolutely amazing. Bad, the Lone Ranger. Boring, bad acting, way too dark for a family feature. Um, yeah, fucking Hell or High Water is a great movie if you've never seen that. Is that the one with Ben Foster and Chris Pine? <laughs> yeah, speaking of Ben Foster, yes. And Jeff Bridges. That, man. It's a great movie. Really? Yeah, I've been wanting to see that for a long time. I just It's one of those things I keep forgetting about it. Yeah, I gotta watch that one. Yes. And uh, I've never even bothered with the Lone Ranger, dude. I mean, I, I did. I put myself through it. <laughs> I'll, I'll say this much about The Lone Ranger. Um, Gore Verbinski's another director where I, I think he's a very immensely talented guy, and sometimes I think he's too far up his own ass to kind of see when he's oh, hasn't yeah. quite put something together that well. Lone Ranger's a great example of that. Um, it has an awesome climax, but by that point, it's two and a half hours and you don't give a shit. Don Chambers lists a bunch of great westerns, uh, like Tombstone, Cowboys vs. Aliens, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, A Fistful of Dollars, Three Tender Yuma, Butch Cassidy, and The Sundance Kid, Bonanza, Gunsmoke, Unforgiven, El Dorado, For a Few Dollars More, Maverick, True Grit, Rawhide, Silverado, The Alamo, uh, Geronimo, Hang 'em High, and the worst, that pile of shit that Disney made, The Lone Ranger. <laughs> All right, man, wait a second now. Cowboys vs. Aliens. I wouldn't have no. put that in the list. It almost no, was our other no, feature. No. And, you know, this fucking guy, he's a year or two younger than I am. Bonanza. Get <laughs> the fuck out of here. <laughs> so full of shit. Uh, other than that, no, that's a good list, man. I've seen, I, I, I think I've seen every single thing on that list. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, True Grit, both original and the remake. I, I think the remake's honestly one a great example of a better than the original film. Uh, yeah, and I, th- I think predominantly that has to do more or less with time. Um, right. You know, the the remake's obviously way more polished and, mm-hmm. you know, bigger budget and everything. No, 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 no disparaging to the original True Grit, which is a fine Western of its time. Well, one of the better John Wayne performances as well. Uh, I, I love Maverick so much. I wish Mel Gibson wasn't a fucking racist so I could recommend I that more to people. It's I such know. a fun fucking movie. <laughs> it's so good. Alfred Molina is so fun in it too. <laughs> the, the, the great Danny Glover cameo. <laughs> uh, so, so much that works about it. Um, but but yeah, and obviously the Dollar Trilogy. Admittedly, I have not seen the ones prior to The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. I've never seen the year oh, no. two. No. Yeah, they, I mean, they're good, man. They're, you know, Sergio Leone. Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid is also one of my favorites. Oh, it's Phenomenal so good. movie. That's yeah. a fantastic movie. Really well put together. Um, Kara <clears throat> Holden says, uh, some of my favorites, Three Tin to Yuma, both original and remake, Django, Not Unchained, um, and the Great Silence, oh, <laughs> The Shootist, and Back to the Future 3. And you know what? I, I will say right here, Back to the Future 3 is one of those really underrated gems for me. I prefer I it to Part 2. Part 2 gets all the love just because of, like, oh, it's the neo-future, this is what the 80s thought yeah. the future would be, and it's like, it's fun. I honestly prefer when it gets into the second half, and it's just, like, revisiting the older movie, but from this different angle. As yeah, Michael I J. Agree. Fox. That's such a cool idea that's never really... And it's interesting, um, my, I remember my dad showed me Back to the Future 2 first, because he's like, oh, the special effects are better. Can't do that. I know, because young Thomas <laughs> was very confused by that movie. Like, why are there two guys from Teen Wolf? Oh, What's going man. on? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, all right, I got to say about the uh, Franco Nero Django movies, mm-hmm. they're they're fun. Yeah. I want to go. As, I want to call them great, but they are so entertaining. Mm-hmm. Those are fun movies, and I, I dug the Three Ten to Yuma remake. I've never seen it's... the original. Uh, I have, but it was a long, long, long time ago, so I mm-hmm. don't really remember it. Um, right. The remake I liked enough. Uh, Russell Crowe kind of gets on my nerves here and there. I, I remember really loving that, especially for That was the movie I discovered Ben Foster in. And I'm like, this guy's an amazing actor. And then he didn't do much of anything after that. <laughs> no, dude. He did, like, yeah, before that, he like Alpha Dog, uh, fucking 30 Days a Night. It was quite a few things, and then... That and like that 
and Dorham movie just killed his career. Oh, God. <laughs> Holy fucking shit, Pandora. <laughs> yeah, dude. Wow. <laughs> and we also have uh, some feedback from our previous episode on Predator. Uh, Casey Girard at The Caser, the underscore Caser, says, As someone who watched Predator for the first time, Chicks watched three hours ago, I'm very interested in what y'all have to say about the sequels, which I should mention, um, since we did that previous show, I have seen The Predator. Um, and I'll say, oh, that's right. Yeah, you know, getting a lot of shit. I'll honestly say it is a fun movie that's extremely messy. Um, that's you can tell they st- studio chopped the fuck out of that. Why would they do? I mean, why? Why chop it up? I, I, I like, why hire Sh- someone like Shane Black and Fred Decker if you're just going to take it away and fucking change it? I mean, it's it's very clear that the f- like last the, the climax of the movie especially feels very reshot over and over again. But still, there's a lot of fun stuff in it, especially those first two thirds. Um, Boyd Holbrook, uh, Trevante Rhodes, uh, Thomas Jane, speaking of which, uh, we talked about him earlier, and Keegan-Michael Key are really great in it. There's some fun Mm -hmm. twists they do on the Predator mythology. Um, There's a few really great moments of just people handling the Predator tech, and the movie mainly feels just like the Predators are trying to get back their toys the whole time, which is a great sort of back and forth that we haven't seen in the other movies before. Um, kind of an AVP, kind of. Kind of. Um, we're not going back down that road. Um, no. I w- but, no. I, I mean, I I don't think it deserves the huge critical lambasting it's getting, but mm. also it is disappointing. That I, I just wish it was a slightly, slightly better feature. Um, but still, I think it ranks like third for me on the list. Wow. Yeah, of Predator movies. Um, I still... You know, watching, and especially after rewatching Predators, which I didn't get a chance to prior to the previous mm. episode, Predators is a much more well-oiled machine, but feels more hollow to me. Versus Pre- The Predator is super messy, but there's a lot more just weird, interesting bits and pieces that I kind of like a bit more than Predators. I don't hate Predators, but I just, especially rewatching, I'm like, man, this is a cool idea that's just kind of paint-by-numbers done. Right. I, well, I haven't seen The Predator yet, obviously, um, but for me, it'd be one, then Predators, then Predator 2, but, mm-hmm. I mean, we'll see after, whenever I eventually see this one. Yes. But I tell um, you, I'm not rushing out for it. <laughs> no, it's not a rush out to see for sure. This is another Netflix watch. Mm. Interestingly, I had a little Twitter conversation after this with Casey. Um, more of a fan of The Predator than even the first Predator. Apparently, he's not as big a fan of the original. Really? interesting but to continue on uh steven d at winning fth has this to say um just listening to your sequels episode and i think predator 2 definitely rates as a decent sequel in a great comic book adaptation um this is obviously i think right before we released our predator episode uh hopefully you also enjoyed that discussion steven um we're kind of in agreement with you and uh kanyahita hondita on instagram says ah yes my favorite romantic comedy alien versus predator Mm -hmm. which it should have been I think it we would love. Been. It basically was. We we would have really preferred love story, but with Alien and Predator, I think we would have. Son of and Brock Lesnar, the Predator. <laughs> <laughs> I could add something going there. Yes, um, we want to thank um, a few people before we leave. Thanks to Chris Oliver, who does the music for our show. Listen to more of his work at chrisoliver.bandcamp.com. Thanks to Emily Scarda for her art. Um, she accepts commissions at fiverr with two R's dot com slash ee scarda. And you can find us um, on Twitter at double edge double bill, uh, which is actually it's at d e d b pod, which is also our Facebook page. Um, and we also have an email at double edge double bill at gmail dot com. And of course. We also have individual accounts ourselves on Twitter. Mine is at not the who's Tommy. Mine's Malekith fan six nine six nine. And just to say, I don't think I've been on it for at least a month. <laughs> at so. least, at the very <laughs> least. Um, you also, I do uh, write reviews over at MarianiThomas.wordpress.com. There's a whole Predator review out there. First review I've written in a while. Um, it's a lot of fun. And of course, subscribe to us on iTunes. Rate and review us to give the show more visibility. But on that note, Adam, it's time to go off into the sunset. Happy trails! (laughs) Good night, everybody.